Hey, what's good? It's Ina. You're watching the second video of a series I'm doing on language learning from a scientific perspective. And in this video, I tackle words and sentence structures. Now, in case you're wondering why I'm wearing this funky hat, it's because it's the most Filipino hat I could find in my house. I love the beach. I'm actually Filipino and I'm shooting from the Philippines. And I just wanted to remember the video this way. Also, in case you don't want to watch the whole video, I'm about to outline the whole thing. And you can refer to the timestamps in the description down below. So with that, let's get into it. We're going to ask, what's a morpheme? And what's that got to do with language learning? Second, we're going to draw a distinction between propositional knowledge and procedural knowledge. Third, we're going to borrow insights from neuroscience and differentiate between language comprehension and language production. And fourth, and finally, we're going to go through some overall study tips. So let's start with morphemes. You can think of morphemes as something like the smallest units of meaning. And when I say the smallest units, I'm referring to something like an element. So for example, we can take the word dogs. How many morphemes do you think the word dogs has? The correct answer is two. Dogs has two morphemes. One being dog, referring to the sweet and cuddly animal that we do not deserve, and s, referring to plurality or signifying plurality. Now why does this topic matter? Often when we're learning languages, we look at the word and sentence structure level. But this is at a higher level than morphology. This is at a higher level than morphemes. So for example, I could take the word girl. If I wanted to express that there's more than one girl, I would say girls. I would just add an S. But in Japanese, they don't have a general way of expressing plurality, only in very rare cases. So for example, watashitachi means we. Watashitachi has two morphemes. Watashi actually means I or me, and tachi signifies plurality. You can say watashitachi, kodomotachi, which mean we and kids. Or the kids, but in most other cases, Japanese doesn't have a general way of expressing plurality. We can also look at inflection in morphology. Inflection is all about word formation. It's about taking a word and transforming it so that the new word expresses a variant of the meaning of the original word. For example, in English, I could say happy. If I wanted to turn it into a noun, I could say happy ness. I would just add ness. Now, English has very, very, very few instances of inflection compared to other languages. In Italian and French, they have way more inflection. Japanese and Korean too. In Italian, Spanish, and French, you have inflection of gender, you have inflection of number, you also have inflection expressing person, first, second, or third person. But in English, we only have about eight instances of inflection. Another example of the role of morphology in languages is that of case marking and word order. Now, English has an S-B-O basic word order. That's subject, verb, object. You can take, for example, the sentence, the cat chased the mouse. Now, you know that the cat is doing the chasing, because it precedes the verb chased. And you know that it is the mouse being chased because it succeeds the verb. Now, Japanese and Korean have an SOV word order, subject, object, verb. Try to wrap your heads around that. Now that's basic word order for Japanese and Korean. You can actually switch around S and O. You can put the object first or the subject first and then the verb last. Now, why is this possible? This is possible because of something called case markers. In Japanese and Korean, they have case markers or particles. If you study the language, then you're definitely familiar with the term. Now, what's a particle? A particle basically tells you the role that a word plays in a sentence. So for example, if I wanted to say, the girl is eating lunch, I would say, Kanojo wa hiru wa no tabemasu. So what insight can this give us? This tells us that there's a relationship between basic word order and case marking in languages. We need a way to signify what role a word plays in a sentence. And so we do that through case marking or perhaps basic word order as in English, or we can look at the role of context. So in Japanese and Korean, they would rather omit words that are naturally implied by the context. So for example, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase tarange, which means I love you in Korean. Now, if you transliterate the phrase, it actually just means to love in the present tense. It's just a verb. It stands alone. So why can we do this? If you were to actually transliterate I love you from English into Korean, you would say nanen noru tarange. Nanen noru tarange. So if I were to break this down, connecting it to what I said earlier, na means I. Nen is a particle that signifies that something is the subject. No means you. Ru is a particle that signifies that it is the direct object in the sentence. And then you have sarange, which is the verb. But Koreans don't say nanun noru very often. You know I love you in Korean to be sarange. And this is because the context implies that it is the person who is speaking that is doing the loving and is the one who is being spoken to who is receiving that love. 
So all of this is to mention again the importance of morphology or studying morphology in language learning. Languages differ systematically at the morphological level as well. And when we're learning languages, we tend to look at the word level or the sentence structure level, but some things just aren't captured by the label words. So for example, we have particles, they're not words. Pepsi or things that are expressing plurality, those aren't words either. Ness or inflection, those aren't words. These are units of meaning. And this makes sense because in language, we're trying to express meaning. We're trying to convey meaning to another person or even to ourselves. Now let's move on to different kinds of knowledge. In cognitive science, there's a concept or notion that there are two types of knowledge. One is procedural knowledge and the other is propositional knowledge. When it comes to propositional knowledge, these are things that you can articulate. So for example, Socrates is a man. People live and die. The sky is blue. Procedural knowledge, on the other hand, has to do with things that you can't quite articulate, but you know how to do. It's your know-how knowledge. So for example, it's like riding a bike, driving a car, tying your shoelaces. And my argument is that it's speaking a language too. Do you know everything you're going to say before you say it? I.e., do you have a paragraph outlined in your head before you speak? I don't think so. In psycholinguistics, it's popularly agreed that language production is incremental. We plan incrementally and we speak incrementally. You don't have absolutely everything you're going to say outlined before you say it. You don't think or contemplate over every single word you're going to say. Now, why is this important to mention? Ultimately, we should be striving to speak and not to translate into another language. Languages are not perfectly correspondent. Just because I say this is an apple is kore wa ringo desu in Japanese doesn't mean that that's exactly what it means. Yes, it means this is an apple, but there's another layer of meaning that indicates formality or respect, and that's signified by this. This is an example that an endless amount of things get lost in translation when you're translating from one language into the other. You're also going to run into some problems or frustrations if you try to translate word for word from your native language into the language that you're learning and vice versa. So ultimately, we should strive to speak in the language that we're learning and not translate specifically. Another shift in perspective is that language is like math. This is actually the reason why I got into language learning in the first place. I found it to be a very computational process. And I know that a lot of you are gonna listen to this and think like, oh man, that just makes it harder or less appealing, you know, just because it's related to math. But honestly, it's related to simple algebra. But you can do simple algebra. You can do x plus five or three plus five or five plus five. I seem to really like the number five. I want you to think of variables as morphemes or words and expressions or the longer side of equations as grammar structures. Now, if you think about language in this computational way, it actually really simplifies the studying process. So for example, if I were to zone in on grammar structures, I would write grammar structures as though they were expressions, algebraic expressions. Now, for each blank, I would assume that each blank takes certain kinds of arguments. And when I say argument, those are just basically things that you fill the blanks with. So for example, I could take the idea that I wanna describe something as something else. Well, I could say, I am Ina in Japanese. So in this case, if I were to extract the grammar structure, I would take blank and then the particle wa and then blank and then this. So in this case, I would note down what arguments each blank will take. So for example, the first blank only takes nouns. As for the second blank, it can take a noun or an e adjective in Japanese. Now, I won't dive any deeper into that sentence. I just want you to understand that grammar structures can be written like equations. And if you write them down as expressions that take certain arguments, then that just simplifies the process for you and allows you to make an endless combination of sentences that are perfectly grammatical. Now let's talk a little bit about neuroscience. Now language comprehension and language production are governed by two different areas in the brain. Language comprehension is governed by Wernicke's area and language production is governed by Broca's area. So what Broca's area does is it transmits information to your motor cortex which allows you to speak. Now, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty about neuroscience or these areas. I just want you to understand that there are different pathways for these two activities that seem to be one thing. Language comprehension or studying language will not necessarily translate into you speaking better. Language production, on the other hand, probably will translate into you being able to comprehend language better. Now, this is because whatever you say or whatever you practice speaking will likely be better encoded into your long-term memory, which is what we want when it comes to language learning. This should tell you that as much as you study this new language, you should be speaking it as much as possible. Speak, speak, speak. Recall the first episode where we talked about speech sounds and how articulating speech sounds is a very special process, like a well-coordinated symphony. This means that we should absolutely be practicing as much as possible. We should be practicing articulating those speech sounds. 
Now that's not only at the level of speech sounds or phonology, it's also at the level of morphology and words and sentence structures. One, you want to be able to articulate these grammatical sentences as fluently and as fluidly as possible. And two, you want to better encode these words and sentence structures into your long-term memory. You'll achieve that by speaking more. So with that, let's get on to some overall tips on how to study. Now, ideally, you want a speaking partner with whom you can speak the language that you're learning as much as possible, as frequently as possible. But for most of us, that's not really a luxury that we have, especially during these times that will not be named. Now I have a solution for this. It's not up to par, but it's pretty effective. And I might sound like a nutcase when I say this, <laughs> but I recommend that you speak to yourself. Speak out loud and conjure up these scenarios that you think are relevant or would probably be frequently occurring. So for example, what I would do is I would think up of a situation where someone was asking me about my background or about my ambitions and my goals my likes or dislikes, my hobbies, why I was learning the language in the first place. There's no reason in principle why you shouldn't be able to speak to yourself. There's no reason in principle why you shouldn't be speaking out loud. Again, I know I might sound crazy when I suggest this, but if this is a testament to the practice, this actually led to me speaking in front of thousands of people in Japanese at an international language conference one and a half years after I started learning Japanese. And besides, you can pat yourself on the back for doing something so weird and cool at the same time. So for other study tips, I recommend writing down all the books that you are learning in the language. Each time you learn a new word, you add it to these lists or a list of lists that you have. And I would recommend describing one, of course, what they mean, and two, the role that they play in sentences. So for example, if a word is a noun or an adjective or a verb, if it's an adjective, what kind of adjective, depending on the language that you're speaking, if it's a verb, what kind of verb? Again, depending on the language that you're speaking. And as I mentioned earlier, I would write grammar structures as though they were expressions, mathematical or computational expressions. Again, I would write the expression and I would write it with blanks and I would describe each blank, noting what kind of arguments that the blank will take. So if it's a noun or if it's an adjective, if it's an adjective, what kind of adjective and things like that. Wow, I know there was a lot, like a lot, a lot. But if you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching. And if you found it helpful, or if you'd like to see the next one, please hit that like button, please slap that subscribe button so I know. Again, you're watching the second video of a series that I'm doing on language learning from a scientific perspective. Peace out to you. Ooh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's go.